welcome to furious driving and today i'm driving a car which really is the epitome of the phrase built for comfort not for speed because this puts the oft into waft the p into practical the umfoot into comfort none of those really work but i didn't plan it so tough this is a mark 3 volvo v70 with a lovely 2.4 five cylinder turbo diesel and this is perhaps the pinnacle peak volvo estate if you will it's just rather wonderful now you go and hit like and subscribe while i play this message from our sponsors and on with the review furious driving proud to be supported by diamond bright protecting cleaning and caring for the furious fleet and for yours with 10 percent off using code fd10 follow the links in the description below hello and welcome to furious driving and it's only a few weeks since volvo announced they were going to stop selling estate cars here in the uk in fact i think they probably have already at this point you can no longer order a volvo estate which to me is an existential crisis for me and for volvo themselves so it seems very fitting today to take out this a v70 mark iii and tell you all about this epic swedish wagon so what is the V70? Now, first of all, there's the naming nomenclature of Volvo. The S, the V, and the XC. S, obviously, is for sedan. V doesn't stand for wagon with an accent. It stands for versatility. And XC is for cross-country because X is an X. X, XC, cross country. Yeah, so the big SUVs are all XCs. And so are, confusingly, some of the four wheel drive estates based on things like this. Now, there were three generations of the V70. It evolved from the 800 series, it became the V series, and ultimately it gave way to the V90 because the V70 grew throughout its life to the point that when the V90 came out, it was an entire size above and the V60 slotted in where it had been before. Now the V70 comes from what you could perhaps describe as the era when Volvo became cool. Bear with me on this. Volvo had always been something of a niche company, like Saab, making cars that were very interesting, very solid, very strong, very safe, with a dedicated following of people, which now as we look back on them, those boxy 700s and 200s and so forth, there's a massive, massive cult following for them. I've got my 740, which I love, and it's just a big Lego brick. Brilliant thing. However, around the time the V series came out, they decided to make themselves a bit more mainstream cool, bring safety to the masses. So the first one, the Mark 1, came out in 1996 and it was basically a warmed over, reskinned, slightly curvier 850. So that was Generation 1. Generation 2 came out in 2000. That was an all new car built on the P2 platform with styling by a British guy called Peter Horbury. So these very, very curvaceous flanks, these strong shoulders, and this cooler sports car nose, as he described it, happened at the front of the car. And that car was very popular and actually pioneered certain things like using adhesive bonding in the structure of the car. So less spot wells, more glue, which is a clever thing to do. Saves time, makes a stronger car, significantly more rigid. Then in 2007, this appeared, the Mark III, which ran all the way to 2016. It looks very similar to the Mark II. However, yeah, there are some subtle differences. The headlights are now more swoopy. So additional swoop got you this car. It's actually incredibly, despite the very similar visual appearance, built on an all new platform. It was built on what Volvo called the p3 platform so shared with the xc90 and the s80 and a bunch of other volvos however in the rest of the world because ford then owned volvo at the time this came out it was also called the eu cd platform so it underpinned things like the galaxy and the s max and the mondeo and the mark ii freelander and a whole bunch of other things but very very similar externally to the p2 and still very much a volvo of the noughties cool but still dependable and very much big at the back now, the back of a Volvo Estate wouldn't be a Volvo Estate without the estate bit, and this is typical Volvo, big, square, chunky back end, and these stacked tall tail lights around the whole height of the thing, like a Mark I Punto, and rising out into the shoulder of the car, became very much a trademark of Volvos throughout the early noughties. The C30, XC90, all of those kind of cars had the same look. The Mark III gained 55 litres of boot space over the Mark II by redesigning the tailgate somehow, apparently. But inside here, let's move this stuff out of the way for you. It is an enormous and very practical space to be. We do have beige carpet to make it light and airy and nice. We've got a pull-out load space cover with a dog guardy thing in there. We've got 40, 20, 60, 20, 40, 60, 20, 40 folding seats. So plenty of options for, for that. And lots of other clever things. We've got these runners down the side. So either you can use the lash down points here to attach things and just lash stuff down, or you can put accessories into these rails and have little games of trains back and forth the side of the boot. We've got a 12 volt power outlet. We've got these incredibly sturdy 
30 aluminium uh, lash down points up high in the boot as well so loads of other options we've got this lift up thing here which has got strappy things little pockets and also it stops stuff rolling around in the boot underneath the floor we've got more load space for just putting practical things in there gloves and winter stuff and underneath that we've got a proper spare wheel it's actually a space saver but it is a proper tire so you're not stranded in the snowy swedish wilderness with just a stupid inflaty can when your tire explodes and isn't inflatable but yeah this is enormous and practical and this light aluminium is a theme we'll come across more on the interior now under the bonnet, Volvo gave us a huge range of options depending slightly on where you live in the world. But there was everything from a 1.6 four-cylinder petrol up to a three-litre six-cylinder petrol. And in diesel, there were four and five-cylinder engines running from two to 2.4 litres. This particular car being a 2008 with the five-cylinder 2.4 diesel makes 163 horsepower. But that's not the headline thing. The headline is the noise this thing makes. Think Alfa Romeo 2.4 five-cylinder. Think Audi Quattro five-cylinder. The warbly rrr 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 noise from this thing is just wonderful it's way more exotic than the car it's sitting in so let's open up these huge sturdy bank vault like doors with actually surprisingly not that sturdy feeling plastic door handles and see what the inside of it is like you'll notice immediately we've got the sips logo stamped into the side of the car there's this little protection here which protects you side impact protection which does all kinds of stuff the extra metal here protects your hips in the event of a uh, impact so you've got sips for your hips you've got whips probably got dips and some other things as well on this car but anyway let's have a look inside are these incredibly comfortable seats and this astonishingly Scandinavian interior. So Volvos of this generation were pioneering this incredibly light and airy and open and flowing feeling of their cabin. So there's no actual black in here really. All this dark area at the top is actually very dark brown on this car with a band of tan which goes all around the rest of the dashboard. Volvo did this so, so well. It's not a glossy uh, lacquered finish. It's a, it's a satin smooth open finish to the wood which looks absolutely gorgeous. It's here in the doors as well with these lovely flowing curves. And anywhere we've got metal, it's a soft aluminum satin finish as well which just looks fantastic so up in the t-shelf huge smorgasbord shelf up here so lots of room for snacks and activities and in the center of it we've got this incredible Aston Martin rising like a monolith in the space 2001 screen for our sat nav and other infotainment desirabilities I know it's not really an Aston Martin screen Aston Martin were part of the Ford PAG premium automotive group at the same time as this and they borrowed the screen and stuck it in the Astons of the day it wasn't that good in that car either now underneath this gorgeous flowing dashboard we've got a couple of things we've got a pop-out key for the uh, ignition which pops back in there as well a start stop button which curiously is oblong rather than round normally it's a big round button here it's a little oblong with the uh, volvo's copyrighted volvo broad font i think it's called and to the right of that we've got these lovely very minimalistic typical volvo very clear very minimal just enough detail to make them interesting without going over the top dials a speedometer up to 160 on the left and the rev counter redlining at about 5000 on the right everything else is hidden by either the smoked screens or is it going to come up on the lcds and the lcds are something we need to touch on quickly because nothing dates as fast as cutting edge technology and these screens looked so exciting and new and fancy when they were new 15 years ago they are still very elegant and very clear and very crisp this lovely white font on the dark background but because modern screens have just come along in such leaps and bounds in the last couple of years they suddenly look very basic indeed and off to the other side of the dials we've got more of this lovely matte open finished wood with the air vent tucked inside it underneath that we've got a little panel with our lighting control of course it's volvo so we've always got running lights all the time and underneath that we have got tucked away our parking brake as well but because this is all light colored plastic underneath the thing feels very very light and airy and also look at this center console you can put your hand right the way through there for obviously no good discernible reason but it just makes the thing feel bigger and opener and more just just airy just a nice place to be of course there's more nice wood there's more satiny silvery stuff the radio's here with a reasonably big screen for 2008 lots of buttons wonderfully lots of buttons i say there's more and more in reviews there's actual buttons the more i drive more newer cars with everything on a screen coming back to actual buttons feels so refreshing we've got dual zone climate we've got tuning and volume either side it's very symmetrical very nicely designed i've got this lovely little person picture picked out in shiny plastic and our heated seats being a volvo the heated seats I'm not even going to dare put them on because it's not sub-zero today and it will set fire to my trousers. This car is an automatic so we've got our shifter just here. The, there were manual and auto options available on this car. Now moving back over to the steering wheel area, 
everything is cream. Very unusual to see a cream steering column, cream indicator stalks, cream steering wheel, everything. Just lovely little creamy, slightly off yellowy colour. Very nice indeed. And big chunky stalks with multiple controls on them. The steering wheel, it's got volume and cruise on it. And of course we've got the horn. Whoa. That's an elk startling pop just there. And running away from any startled elk over there, we've got these beautiful cream colored doors with this lovely wood insert, the uh, solid metal door pull. We've got all four electric windows. We've got electric mirrors, which are power fold as well. And we've got our lock, central locking button here on there as well. Underneath that, big speaker at the bottom, tweeter at the top, and a decent size cubby in, at the bottom. And we've also got a, a padded vinyl-y stuff armrest in the middle and uh, knowing Volvos of old I suspect this whole vinyl padded area will in about 10 years time start to split and be impossible to replace and just hunch really just a hunch moving back into the center of the car we've got a couple more accessory areas roller decks this little cover back here we've got twin cup holders got a random slot for who knows what and a 12 volt socket and in the middle we've got a big cubby and inside here as well as being quite commodious we've got an aux in for a standard headphone socket we've got a computer type phone connection for a phone that no longer exists we've even got a remote for that thing over there because if that's too far to reach or the stalk is too far to reach you can control it from here which is amazing up above we've got a couple of other interesting cool things we've got our little display up here around our interior light we've even got a readout in the mirror telling us which direction we were facing I actually thought it meant that the car was in neutral when I first turned it on turned out the car was just facing north so yeah be aware of that let's have a look in the back now the back of the V70 is a nice place to be because it is a very big place to be. These seats are just ah oh, lovely and comfy. That's a big selling point on the V70 was the extreme comfort level. The seats are very cleverly molded as well. You've got these integrated headrests in the front which don't take too much of your vision space looking from the back into the windscreen. We've got uh, cutouts in the back of the seats for your knees so it feels bigger. In fact there's two centimeters more legroom in the Mark III over the Mark II so if you've got bigger kids in the back and you're looking at buying one of these that's a consideration. The doors very similar to the front got these lovely bits of wood got the nice metal door handles electric windows a bottle holder huge speakers there are air vents up here in the b post which is great often you do get air vents down in the center console but it doesn't really do a lot to blow it onto your face that's a much nicer place for the air vent to be in the center we have got a 12 volt socket there is also the option though to have a complete infotainment system with separate rear screens in the back of here as well that's quite a unusual and expensive option to have spec'd in the first place right let's get the v70 out on the road and see what it's like to drive oh, i love that noise that's so cool Driving the V70 is unlike driving many other things unless you happen to be the captain of the Queen Mary. It is enormous, it's over 4.8 meters long, which puts it close to my Crown Victoria, which has become my reference point for things that are ridiculously big. It's also quite wide, it's 1.8 meters wide and change. So parking the thing can actually be something of an issue. Well, the, the, the wheels are fairly near the corners, so maneuvering isn't too hard, but it's just the sheer bulk of the thing. Visibility is incredibly good out of it, so you don't feel like you're struggling to work out where to put the thing, but it is just a lot of it. But then we come to the comfort, because it has all of the comfort. These seats are, oh yeah, some cars get expensive accessories like massage and vibrating functions to make you feel like you've earned something special by sitting in them this thing it just exists in a state of pure soft lovely comfortableness that is virtually unbeatable you just oh, sink into it and it's a lovely ah no amount of rich Corinthian leather could ever be nicer than this it ties in very well with the suspension because the suspension is on the wobbly side, it has to be said. 
This is definitely a car that is built for long distance cruises rather than back lane blasts. Up until the Mark II, there had been a V70R, which was a performance version with lots more power, stiffer suspension. It's basically taking on the M3 and the M5 in Swedish estate format, which is a very exciting and fun thing to do. However, when they got to the version three, they canned that. There was an R design version, which is purely a trim level with lots of sort of racy looking stuff, but it wasn't actually harder sprung or more powerful or anything. It just looked good with blue bits on it. Now, across the generations of the car and the various models, there were four different gearbox options you could go for. There was a five and a six speed manual, and there was a six and an eight speed automatic. So yeah, lots of choice. Now, given the, the nature of the car, if you will, a lot of these were bought by older buyers. I'm not saying the National Trust sticker in the windscreen of this car, which came from the previous owner, is an indication of how it was treated previously, but it's not a surprise to find it there, put it that way. So a lot of them were specced with automatics. If you're looking for a car which is going to be ULES compliant, you need to be looking at one of the later ones. They facelifted it in 2013 and you want to go for a smaller engine and a newer model. Because unfortunately this one, although it's a delightful car with a delicious 2.45 pot, this one you have to pay £12.50 to drive into London or Birmingham or various other cities, which is a shame. At the time this came out, Volvo were pushing to make their cars a lot cooler, a lot more interesting, a lot more fun. So you look at things like the C30, which shared the platform with the Ford Focus. And of course the ST and the C30 did actually share engines as well as platforms. The V30 was a thinking hooligans car. And they followed that whole family look across this, the S saloons, the V estates, and of course the XCs like the XC90. And when it came out, the XC60, which shared the face and the shoulders and all that kind of stuff. So it was a strong look. And looking back, I do think it was actually pretty cool. I did consider one of these cars to replace my W204 Mercedes when I replaced it a year or so ago. But this is still a car that every time I see one drive past, I go, ooh, what if, maybe, should I? And naturally, being a Volvo, it is enormously safe, as well as being enormous. It's got five-star end cap when it came out, 80-something percent in occupant protection. Um, it's even got airbags in the squabs of the seats to protect your hips in the event of a side impact. It's a very, very safe car to be. Volvo always sold themselves on the safety image, even though, admittedly, sometimes there were rivals that did actually score better, but there was always, if you want to be safe, buy a Volvo. That was the way it was. Yeah, so chucking it into a roundabout. We have lean! We have lean! This was, and still is, a very good chassis, but obviously with the very soft suspension settings, it does roll a lot. In the previous generation's R model, it was a really sharp handling car. It would only take a few tweaks of the suspension to get one of these into a, well, a very respectable, you know, fast road, hot handling, uh, rapid estate. And come on, a fast estate is so much cooler than any SUV you care to mention, isn't it? sitting out here on a faster bypass it's so smooth and comfy you can imagine just doing epic distances in one of these things because it's so smooth and comfortable so quiet that lovely growly 2.4 oh, there's a p2 um, now if your intentions were not sporting but more Land Rover like then there was of course the XC70 which is basically one of these but on tall jacked up suspension with plastic block body cladding which is a car I'm also fascinated by because it's the most practical yet the most comfortable it's a best of all worlds kind of thing really isn't it especially if you bung this big five port diesel on it how good would that be I do think it's an absolute tragedy that Volvo have decided to drop the estates from their range here in the UK because they were what defined these cars to find their brand for so long. If you thought of antique dealers and just moving stuff, especially moving stuff quickly in the days of the R models, then you thought of a Volvo. It really was, yeah, draw a picture of an estate car, you drew a Volvo. So it's a real shame that they've decided to go SUV only. I'm really hoping that trend will reverse and they will renege on that. Currently, the police can still order an estate version of these things. So in the future, if you want an estate Volvo, you have to buy an ex-police version of one. Interesting thought. The controls do feel pretty much as you'd expect. It's a big car and sort of fairly heavy and the controls kind of reflect that actually. It does feel like a bit of weight in the steering and a bit of resistance in the pedals. So it does feel like you are driving something. 
it's actually far heavier steering in this than in my old 740, which is like fingertip light. One thing we haven't got in this car though is flappy paddles, so there's no manual override on the steering wheel. You do though have the up and down option here on the shifter itself. So I can see in the screen I've dropped down to third there. Third? I can't even talk properly anymore. The problem with those kind of shifty things is that there's always a huge amount of lag between pushing the lever and anything actually happening. That's not a Volvo thing, that's an everything thing. So, if you've been wondering how comfy is a Volvo V70, is it a car that's big enough to fit my grand piano in, should I buy one instead of something more mundane? The answer is probably yes. It's very nice, it's very good, and you'll probably love it unless you really do need some proper sports car handling, in which case, go and buy an MX-5. <laughs> Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this, please, as always, hit like and subscribe, and join me again next time driving something completely different. Hello and welcome to Furious Driving and there is no way I'm doing a Volvo estate review and not sitting in the boot. It didn't go down, did it?